Hi, thanks for watching this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. So my talk is going to be about how to develop a real-time application for an embedded system using an heterogeneous multiprocessing system. Uh, my name is Sergio. I'm from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I've been working with uh, embedded systems for uh, more than 20 years. For the last eight to nine years, I've been working with my company, uh, Embedded Labworks. We've been doing a lot of training and consulting services. Uh, related to embedded systems and the usage of uh, operating systems on embedded Linux, Android, RTOS. I'm very active here in Brazil in the embedded systems community. I have a blog in Portuguese, sergioprado.org. I also have a blog in English, embeddedbits.org. I also contribute to a lot of uh, open source projects like uh, BuildRoot, Yocto, and the Linux kernel. So our agenda here, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what is an heterogeneous multiprocess system. Um, so it's a little bit of an introduction on the topic, uh, the motivations. Uh, then we're going to talk a, a little bit about uh, IMX7 from uh, N NXP. So we're going to have some hands-on in this presentation. The NXP IMX7 has two cores, a Cortex-A7 and a Cortex-N4. So that's a perfect uh, combination for, uh, to show you the, the communication between the cores. So in the first hands-on that I will show you, uh, we will we we'll have Linux running on the Cortex A7 and uh, FreeRTOS running on the Cortex N4. After that, we're going to talk a little bit about how the communication between the core works. And I'm going to introduce the OpenMP standard and the RPMSG framework. And then we're going to have the second hand zone where I'm going to show you how the communication between the core works. Uh, there is a nice uh, demo that I prepared here where uh, the Cortex M4 will read a sensor and then will um, monitor uh, the temperature in the sensor. Uh, and if the temperature exceeds a threshold, you, it will take a decision. So it should be um, deterministic. That's why we're doing this on the Cortex M4. And then after that, we're going to send a message to the Cortex A7, where we have Linux running. And then uh, Linux will receive this message and update a web page. <clears throat> OK, uh, so let's start with a little bit of introduction on heterogeneous multiprocessing systems. We know the, the power of an embedded system uh, is growing, right? We have uh, any, uh, the, the costs of the ships are reducing and the capacity uh, is increasing, right? So we have more and more processors inside the ship. We have more and more interfaces inside the ship. Uh, and since the costs are reducing, and the uh, requirements to develop an embedded system also uh, is growing, right? So um, nowadays we have to develop an embedded system that needs to have low latency, that needs sometimes to have a rich graphical interface, that needs to be deterministic, that uh, needs to have some throughput, some uh, power to process data that needs to be secure, that needs to be low power. So as you can see here, uh, we have a lot of trade-offs, right? The requirements, uh, they are, these, these are conflicting requirements, right? Uh, for example, uh, throughput and determinism. And they are, uh, the, if you need a deterministic system, you're going to have to, you're going to have some problems with throughput. And uh, the same, if you need a lot of throughput, 
uh, you don't you won't have a lot of determinism in your system so they are conflicting right um, so how to develop a system with all of these conflicting requirements we could use Linux right uh, we to develop a system with all of these features we need a rich operating system and nowadays Linux is the kernel used to develop that kind of system right when I mean, you need a rich graphical interface networking uh, throughput the problem is the real-time part so if you need a low latency system a real-time system a deterministic system uh, can we use the Linux kernel for that that's the question so before answering that let me just uh, define here what is a real-time system so in my opinion uh, a real-time system is a system where the time is part of the requirements so you have a system you have an input you have to process you have to generate an output uh, in a real-time system not only the result is important but the time it takes to generate the result is, all, is also important so you have events and you have deadlines to process the events um, there are some categories of real-time systems so there are for example the soft real-time system where uh, an eventual failure uh, uh, is not a problem for example in a video streaming system if you lose uh, one or two frames per second it's not going to be a problem right you can't lose 30 frames per second that would be a problem but one or two is not going to be a problem so that's a kind of soft real-time system we also have the hard real-time system where each and every failure is a problem so you can't miss any event if you miss uh, an event uh, the for example someone could die so like a collision detection system in a vehicle is an, an example of a hard real-time system so the question is um, can we use Linux we know Linux is very good for uh, for doing a, a rich graphical system for doing networking for uh, processing data but can you also use Linux in a real-time system the short answer is no we can't the Linux kernel is focused on throughput right it's a generic kernel for an operating system so by default it doesn't have any real-time capability but of course there are options so for example uh, we have the project called preempt RT it's a group of patches that if you apply in your kernel you will have uh, soft, a soft real-time system it will improve a lot latency jitter and you you could use, could use uh, a Linux with a preempt RT with the preempt RT patches for a, a soft real-time system but not for a hard real-time system you could still lose some events and that is not acceptable acceptable for a hard real-time system so for a hard real-time system you will need uh, some extension and that is for example the Xenomai extension uh, that is applied uh, over Linux and then you could you have a hard real-time system the problem with these extensions is that it's very complex to use and it's very time-consuming because you have to to write a lot of code to work with these extensions uh, so if I need to develop a system with hard real-time requirements what should I do or, or what could be the best approach today to handle this in the harder so that's how we are doing today right so using a dedicated system to handle the real-time requirements has been the most common solution nowadays right 
So we have basically uh, an external processor, microcontroller, FPGA, uh, to handle the real-time uh, stuff. And then you leave Linux alone handling the not real-time part, like graphical interface, network, and etc. And then you could uh, connect, right, these uh, uh, processors using some bus like I2C, SPI, and they make them communicate somehow. And of course, you could have both processors inside the same chip, right? Uh, so we could have a processor with a core ARM Cortex A9 and a microcontroller uh, based on an ARM Cortex M4 connected via I2C, for example. Or we could have both processors in the same chip, right? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between these two solutions in the next slides. And that's what we call a uh, heterogeneous multiprocessing system, right? So it's a system with uh, heterogeneous uh, processors, processors with different architectures. And this is very common, right? We have uh, SOC with uh, a general processor, with GPU, with DSP. So it's an example of heterogeneous multiprocessing system. And that's really the best uh, cost, the, the, the solution with the best cost benefit to handle real time in a Linux system. Right, you do the general stuff in Linux, and you do the real-time stuff in a in an external processor. And when you have uh, uh, when you have two processors with different different architectures in the same chip, and you run uh, different OSs, like you run the Linux on the Cortex A9, and you run uh, an RTOS, like free RTOS or other RTOS, in a Cortex M4, we have an asymmetric mode processing system. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to basically be our topic here. But let's first talk a little bit about the difference between uh, having the heterogeneous multiprocessing system in different chips, right? You you have a chip with a microcontroller, for example, and a chip with a microprocessor, and having them in the same SOC. Let's just talk a little bit about both solutions and compare them. So a solution with uh, with the chips separated, right? Uh, I'm calling here a multi-chip uh, heterogeneous multiprocessing system. So we have here the microprocessor and we have here the microcontroller and they are connected somehow. Could be a serial interface, a serial port, it could be um, I2C, SPI, some IO pins, analog signals. We could connect them using some kind of interrupt so one processor can uh, wake up or notify the other processor. And then, of course, we would have uh, two operating systems, one running inside of each of the cores. We would have some kind of protocol, right, uh, that we would need to uh, define so the cores could communicate with each other. What about a single chip solution? It's the, basically uh, the same thing, but they are inside the chip, right? They are pretty much closer and integrated. So we have a key here, both cores, core one and core two, they are connected. They will share some peripherals. They will share memory, probably. Uh, 
we will have some kind of interrupt mechanism so one core can notify the other core or, of something or some event and if we think about the uh, software it's the same thing right uh, the the cores are heterogeneous they are different we're gonna run uh, uh, an operating system in one core and another operating system in another core so in the microcontroller for example we're gonna run the RTOS and uh, on the processor we're gonna run the Linux kernel and then we have some kind of hardware block here to handle the communications the communication between the cores of course there are trade-offs between the solutions uh, developing using a multi-chip solution where the the processors are separated and developing using a single chip solution where the processors are integrated in the same chip so uh, in terms of cost a single chip solution solution is cheaper right uh, you have just one chip so you will probably be cheaper than you have to buy two different chips the processor and the microcontroller for example but we have less options for the single chip solution right we have hundreds and hundreds of op options for the multi-chip solution uh, but we ha don't have that many options in a single sh chip solution uh, but the in the single chip solution the integration is better they are they are closer to each other so the communication is faster right we can't compare like using shared memory to communicate between the cores that's going to happen in the single chip solution with like a communication using i square c that is pretty much lower but of course the software complexity is higher in a single ship, ship solution right uh, because, because you're gonna have to to handle uh, and run different operating systems inside the same chip but it's easier to develop the hardware you have just one chip right to put the board in but it's going to be uh, easier to upgrade the hardware if you are in a multi-chip solution right because in a multi-chip solution you can upgrade for example the microcontroller and and don't upgrade the processor and vice versa here again we have to upgrade everything so as you can see we have trade-offs between the solutions but i think uh in the next few years as we we're going to see more and more of this kind of multi-chip solutions so i think the the uh, options available for a, a, a single chip solution will increase I think we're gonna he have more tools to handle the software complexity so I think the tendency is to have more and more single chip solutions to handle uh, to develop an embedded system with all of these uh, conflicting requirements okay uh, now let's talk a little bit about the implementation so i'm going to use here uh, the imx7 from nxp uh, i don't work for nxp i use it a lot uh, and this is a nice and easy implementation of uh, an heterogeneous multiprocessing system that's why i choose the mx7 uh, so the IMX7 has two cores, an ARM Cortex A7 and an ARM Cortex M4. They are in a master slave uh, architecture, so the Cortex A7 is the master, the Cortex M4 is the slave. What that means? Means that when you turn on the SOC, the Cortex A7 will run and the Cortex M4 will be stopped and it need to be started by the cortex a7 so the cortex a7 will control the execution of the cortex m4 
We have also a hardware block for for interprocess communication. It calls it call it is called message unit, and we have two hardware blocks for uh, sharing. So one problem we could have when developing a, a system with heterogeneous processors is that uh, they could share a peripheral, for example. So they could share IO pins, they could share serial ports, they could share buses. So we need to have some kind of locking mechanism uh, to prevent the a concurrency problem between the, the cores. And the Cortex uh, and the IMX7 from XP uh, has two uh, hardware blocks for uh, sharing, to control uh, the sharing of resources, memory, peripherals. RDC and SEMA4, we're going to talk about them. So this is the um, block driver diagram from IMX7, and it, we, we can see the, the block related to the uh, communication between the cores there the multi-core unit and the three blocks inside there, MU, RDC, and semaphore. So the MU messaging unit is a block, uh, is a hardware block from IMX7 that uh, we can use to implement the communication between the cores. Basically, this uh, hardware block provides eight registers, four uh, reception re registers, and four transmitter registers transmission registers uh, and it also provides 12 uh, interrupt sources so one core can uh, notify another core of something uh, as you can see eight registers is not enough right to send data from our core, one core to the other that's why we usually use uh, memory to send real data so the registers are used only to give pointers to memory. So one core receives a pointer, it goes to, it goes to memory to take the data. One nice feature of IMAX 7 is that one core can wake up the other because this uh, interrupt sources from the messaging unit uh, can be used as a wake up source. You, you put the, the, the core in low power mode and it could be wake up by the other core. This is a diagram of the messaging unit block where we can see all of the, the registers here, the status and control registers, and here we have the reception and transmission registers. Here is a diagram uh, that's showing the communication between the cores. Uh, so, for example, processor A wants to send a message to processor B. So processor A is going to write in the transmission register and clear the transmission empty uh, bits in the transmission status register that will automatically set the reception full bits in the reception status register and if the processor B has in, uh, the interrupt enabled it's going to receive the interrupt, get the data, clear the reception full bits that will automatically set the transmission empty register and if the processor A has interruption able it is going to be notified that the processor B received the data. So that's the whole communication between the cores here using the messaging unit registers. This is another example uh, just for uh, like notifying the cores here are not exchanging data. So processor A was wants just to notify processor B. It's going to write uh, in a generic interrupt request register that's going to set the semi bits in the register of the other uh, processor. And if it has interrupt enabled, it's going to uh, handle in an interrupt service routine. Uh, and when it's done, it's going to write clear that bit that's going to clear the bit in the register of the uh, requesting processor. So it's 
a way to implement a notifying mechanism between the cores. Of course, we don't need to worry too much about that because the vendor and XP provide drivers that will abstract all of this communication. But of course, it's good to know how it works. The RDC, uh, it's a block, uh, it's a hardware block from IMAX 7 that uh, provides a way for us to allocate peripherals to cores and memory uh, and isolate them. We can create up to four uh, research domains and we can put uh, peripherals and memory regions inside these research domains and then we can allocate research domains to cores. So the idea here is that we can allocate, for example, uh, an SPI bus to the Cortex M4 and then the processor, the Cortex A7, won't have access to that bus. Just an example. Right, so we have here the processor, the Cortex A7, we have here the microcontroller, the Cortex M4, we can have a research domain for the processor, we can have a research domain for the microcontroller, here are the peripherals for each research domain, and of course you could have uh, some peripherals and memory regions shared between the cores in another research domain. And then here we should use a semaphore right to uh, handle concurrency between the the access to the uh, research domains. So the RDC also provides uh, a mechanism to to handle that uh, semaphore to handle this sharing of resources. And the third and final block related to the communication between the cores is the SEMA4 block. It's a, a general uh, SEMA4 implementation that you could use for anything, right? Basically, we have 16 gates. Uh, if a processor writes to a gate, it will lock something. The semantics here depends on the application. So you write in a gate, you lock it, and it's yours, right? So you could associate as a specific peripheral with a gate, and then both cores will try to write to that gate to get access to that core. If it can't, it should wait. Very good. So to now, we talk a little bit about uh, heterogeneous multiprocessing systems, we take a look at how it is implemented on an IMX7. So let's talk a little bit about the software stack to go to the first hand zone. So we have an ARM Cortex M4 and an ARM Cortex A7. We're going to run an RTOS on an ARM Cortex M4 and in our case we're going to run free RTOS. It's uh, the RTOS basically adopted by NXP for their demos and BSPs, and in, it's an option, right? We have, of course, another options, but it's an option, it's the default option from an XP, and uh, we're gonna use it free RTOS. And it's very popular, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to use, it's very simple, AP. it has a very simple API, it's small. On the other side, on the processor, of course, we're gonna run a Linux distribution, a small Linux distribution um, built with uh, open embedded. And of course, the M4, as I said, is the slave, so it's gonna have to be wake up by the A7. And uh, in the implementation by NXP, the bootloader is gonna be responsible to wake up the M4 before starting the Linux kernel. So now let's go to our, to our first hands on. What I have here, I'm, I'm going to use a board from Tradex. Tradex is a Swiss company. They develop uh, system modules like this one. I'm going to use in my presentation the Colibri IMX7 connected to this baseboard, the Aster board, right? 
uh, in the first demo we're gonna write uh, we're gonna use this LED to blink on an ARM Cortex-24 and then I'm also gonna show uh, the usage of the serial port here so I'm gonna now open my environment here to run the demo I have here a camera pointing to the board so we can see right the LED blinking uh, what I have here well I have here in this terminal uh, on the left this is the console from Linux I'm gonna reboot the board here is the bootloader you boot it's going to start the kernel We should have a terminal in seconds. Okay, and now we are inside Linux. Right, nothing is running on the Cortex M4 to now because we didn't load anything in memory to run the Cortex M4. So now I'm gonna go to this terminal here. I have a demo from XP. Uh, it's basically a blinking demo. I'm gonna open the main.c here. It's basically a demo uh, using FreeRTOS, right? This is the main function, hardware initialization, GPIO initialization, just a print on the serial port. Here we have a cable, right? This cable here. This cable here is uh, connected to the serial port that is going to be used by the Cortex M4, and this print function will send messages to this serial port, and we're gonna show here in this terminal. Here is creating a task, and that's it. Starting the scheduler. The task is here. It's a simple task that's gonna to toggle a, a GPIO and it's going to blink this LED um, here every every uh, 500 milliseconds very good another thing I, I want to show you here the code is the GPIO control dot C the toggle function uh, here is the toggle function. As you can see, the sample code are using the semaphore from the uh, RDC hardware block, right? Because this is a, a peripheral that's been shared with Linux. So you should use a semaphore to not have erases here, right? Okay, so it's a simple, simple uh, example uh, to blink a LED on the Cortex uh, M4. I'm gonna go to the build director, directory build the project. It's going to generate an L file. This is the L file generated. Now I'm gonna copy this F file. Uh, to my board using SCP, so I'm connected over network the board. I'm going to copy this L file to the boot director of uh, Linux. Copy it. So now here we have this file m4.l, right? Uh, this is the L file that's going to be uh, interpreted by the bootstrap from the bootloader and loaded in memory and uh, used by the M4 to run, right? So now I'm gonna reboot the board. Stop the boot. Now I'm in the bootloader prompt. I'm gonna show you here an environment variable from your boot. M4 boot. 
that's the variable responsible to load the Cortex M4 code to memory and boot the processor. So it's going to use the fetch load command to load this file m4.elf uh, from the fat partition to memory at this address. And then it's going to use the command boot out to boot uh, the processor. And the processor will start to fetch instructions from this memory. And that's where we have our blinking demo code, right? Uh, if I just run boot, the boot command will just run. I can actually just run the, this command and to see uh, the Cortex M4 working. So I'm gonna run it. Uh, I just run it. It loads the elf. It starts the core, and we can see here the LED is blinking, right? And the core is running. So now, right now, we have the bootloader U-boot running on the Cortex A7, and we have the our blinking demo running on the Cortex M4. If I just run boot here, I will start Linux, and then we have Linux running on the Cortex A7, and FreeRTOS with the blinking LED demo running on the Cortex M4. Let me show here another demo. The, let me show the Hello World demo. Here is a simple demo that will skip writing stuff to the serial ports, right? We have a task. The task will print the Hello World to the serial ports every, I think, one uh, second. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the build directory. I'm gonna build it. I'm gonna copy to my board. Let me just change here the name. It's uh, hello world dot elf. I'm gonna reboot. In the boot, it's going to load the firmware and start the processor. And we can see now we're running and booting Linux on the left terminal. And on the right terminal, we have the prints from the Cortex M4. So, uh, as you can see here, we have two different operating systems running in two different processors inside the IMX uh, 7 from XP. Uh, what is missing here is the communication, right? So now let's uh, shift again to our presentation to talk a little bit about the communication between the cores. So we have a standard. We have the, a standard called OpenAMP or OpenAMP. Um, it's, a, it's an open source framework for asymmetric multiprocessing systems, where you have uh, different operating systems running in different processors, and, they, and we want them to communicate with uh, themselves. So the OpenMP is a standard, and it is a project because we have an implementation of that standard. It's on GitHub. And this standard includes basically three parts, light cycle operations, messaging, and proxy operations. Uh, in the light cycle operation, we have this component, the remote proc. It is responsible to manage the cores, right? So the OpenAMP is a standard where you should have a master slave configuration. So one processor is the master that will control the other processors, the slave processor. Now, like power on, power off, load firmware, things like that. Uh, this standard also provides a framework to, to communicate for the communication between the cores. It is called the RPMSG. And also we have uh, 
standard to implement a remote procedure recall, like one processor can call uh, services from other or request services from other core. So it's, it is three different components. Uh, we're going to focus here on the RPM SG because we're going to talk about a little bit about how the communication between the core works. Right. So this is the representation uh, of the RPM SG. It's two different diagrams, right? Here we have uh, Linux, we have uh, Cortex R as a slave and a Cortex A as a master. So the Cortex A controls the Cortex R, the microcontroller here. And of course, Linux is going to use the remote proc implementation to control this core. And in this other block, it's the other way around. So the master is the microcontroller, Cortex R, and the slave is the Cortex A. So here the RTOS is going to use a remote proc to control and uh, they slave in that case it's linux running on the cortex a and rpm sg is used to implement the communication between the cores so uh, our focus here is going to be on the rpm sg so rpm sg is a protocol with uh, basically three layers right to implement this communication between the cores from the hardware perspective what we need we need two things uh, shared memory and intercore interrupts. So we need memory to transfer data between the cores, and we need some uh, kind of uh, uh, notification mechanism into the cores. Although we could, you, you could do it this in software, uh, doing pooling, but uh, it's not recommended. Uh, it's better to have interrupts for that. So in RPM SG, we have uh, basically three layers, right? These three layers. Uh, the, the first layer here is the physical layer, and then we have the Mac layer, and then the RPM SG layer. Basically, the physical layer is uh, related to the hardware, right? Here we have the drivers to use the hardware blocks to, for the communication between the cores. In our case, is the messaging unit hardware block from the IMX7. Here is the middle layer, uh, it's the, the virtual layer. Basically, it's a layer where we uh, allocate uh, memory for the communication. It's a buffering system. And in the third layer here, it's the transport layer, right? Where we have uh, a kind of format. Uh, it looks like uh, the TCP layer right on the cpip protocol uh, i'm going to show a little bit about this uh, what we have here inside the rpm sg so the first layer is related to the hardware right we basically need a shared memory uh, mechanism and a way to interrupt cores right so this in our case is the messaging unit from imx7 the mac layer uh, it's the layer responsible for allocating uh, buffers. So the OpenMP standard uses the VTIO implementation from the Linux kernel as a base in this layer. The VTIO is a layer used in the Linux kernel um, by virtualization and emulation software. So, for example, a virtualization software could uh, communicate with the host system using a virtual I.O. interface. So it's basically a buffering mechanism where, for example, in our case, we have a CPU that wants to communicate with a microcontroller right inside the IMX7. So it's going to allocate a V-ring struct that will point to a lot of ring descriptors that will point to buffers. Uh, this is ring buffers. One thing cool about this implementation is that it's lock free. So you don't, if you have just one writer and one reader, you don't, you don't need to worry about uh, locking. Uh, so you can allocate and write and read buffers without locking, without 
uh, worrying about the sharing, right? Because it's implemented that way. And the final layer, the transport layer, is worry about the message itself, right? So we have a mechanism of addressing, so we can have a search and destination address, uh, the length of the data, some flags, and the payload. The payload basically is the buffers located via the MAC layer. So we're going to always have a master core and one or more remotes. In our case, it's just one master and one remote. Each remote is an RPM SG device that will provide a communication channel. And each communication channel could have one or more endpoints. So it's something like that. In this example, we have one master and two slaves, or two remotes, right? Each one has an, uh, uh, a communication channel. So we, can, for, we can't, for example, communicate between the two remotes in this architecture. Uh, it's the master that communicates with each of the remotes. And then uh, inside the communication channel, we could have one or more endpoints. Uh, it's kind it's like a TCP port, right, in the TCP IP protocol. So you could hold open one or more endpoints here to receive messages. Uh, this is uh, very fast the, how the RPM SG works. Well, we have implementation for that, right? So we also already have implementation of the RPM SG and the OpenAMP protocol on the Linux kernel, so we don't need to worry about that. We just need the drivers from the vendor for the hardware blocks, like we need a driver for the messaging unit. On the microcontroller side, we need uh, also the OpenAMP implementation that we have in that uh, GitHub link that I showed earlier. Uh, of course, we're going to need uh, also the drivers for the hardened blocks from the vendor. And we can integrate, integrate on our firmware, on, on our RTOS, although we already have some uh, integrations done, like we have uh, OpenMP integrated on the Zephyr, uh, that's an RTOS from the Linux Foundation. We have, of, of course, for the free RTOS and for other RTOSs as well. Uh, NXP changed a little bit how uh, the OpenAMP is implemented on the FreeRTOS because it is not really RTOS aware. Like when the message comes from the other core, the message was handled inside the interrupt. It's not, it, this is not good, right? On an RTOS architecture, we should stay too much inside an interrupt. So they changed that a little bit, like you don't handle anything inside an interrupt context. Uh, when you receive a message, it's going to wake up a task, it's going to receive the data, and it's going to handle inside a task. So we don't uh, stay too much inside an interrupt. On the Linux, we also have uh, the RPA message implemented using the virtual bus. Basically, they implemented another bus called RPMSG bus that's going to use virtual bus to send messages to the other core. Uh, so there is a message defined by the RPMSG standard called name serve announcement. So when both cores start, the remote will, annou will announce itself and then this message will uh, come to this RPM message bus that's going to create an interface for the user to communicate with the remote core. So the architecture is something like that. Here we can clearly see the three uh, layers, right? The RPM message bus, virtual bus, and the uh, hardware layer. Uh, here are the drivers from an XP, here are the virtual bus, the Mac layer, and here are the transport layer, the RPMSG. So when the remote announces itself, 
the message will come up here to the RPM SG bus that will create an interface for the user to communicate with the core. Uh, it's very simple in the end because you just read and write from this file is going to the message is, is going to uh, end here and the other way around. To make this happen, of course, I have to enable some configurations in the Linux kernel, enable some drivers. Basically, what you have in this diagram, I, ha I had to change a little bit the device tree to enable the hardware blocks. And in the end, uh, it worked. So I'm going. I, I want to show you now and finish my presentation with uh, some demos. So the first one is this. It's just an echo echo demo. So let me go here. Open the RPMSG. RPM SG. I'm gonna open here the let me see STR Echo Free Artos. So this demo, let me open here the C file. We have a task is going to print in the start. Uh, a description of the task is going to wait here. This is the announcement message, so it's going to block here until the uh, until Linux comes up and answers, and then it's going to say the handshake is done. We are ready to communicate, and, and it's going to go to a infinite loop to uh, receive a message, show the message, and send it back. Right. Let's build it and run. Okay. Let me copy here. Transfer into the board. Now I'm going to reboot the board. Right, we have here this message, right, the demo message. Initialize it. We can see now that the handshake is done, so they are ready to communicate with each other. A few more seconds to get the console. Okay, what we have here? We have here this file and this file is going to be used to communicate with the other core so if I just echo something to this file it receives it the message and send back of course to get the message back I should read this file I have here a small script to do that So this script is just open in this file, in another file descriptor, reading and printing the output on the console. So I'm going to just execute this file, this shell script here. And now if I just echo something, as you can see, I echo hi, the other car received the hi message, sent back. And then here are the message back to the Cortex A7 core. So we have here message going from Cortex A7 to Cortex M4, and then the Cortex M4 to Cortex A7 using RP MSG. The final demo that I'm going to show you it's a kind of a temporary monitoring system. This one. So basically, what I have here is a system that will uh, 
uh, in theory, right, a read a sensor. Uh, if the, the, the read uh, exceeds a threshold, it's going to uh, set a fan and then notify the other core. Of course, I don't have here a temperature sensor, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to emulate that using the setup port. So it's like uh, the setup port will, is going to provide the read of the, the sensor for the application. And then on the other side, what I have? I have a web server running. So I have a, here a web server running uh, that uh, is going to read a text file and show information in the text file uh, about the temperature on the other core. So let's run this, this demo. I'm going to build it. I'm going to copy to the board. Copy it. I'm going to reboot the board. Should see messages here. Starting temperature monitor task. It's running. Handshakes done. That's good. Right. So now, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, this is the serial port, the right terminal. Uh, the the application inside the Cortex M4 is reading the serial port just to emulate the temperature sensor. So if I send here an ASCII to character is going to interpret that as a, a number, right? And that's the read of the sensor. So, and it's going to send this message to the other car. So let me just run here a script that I created. That let me show you. Uh, let me remember here the temp. This one. So this is the script that, is, that I'm going to run. So what script does? Let me do something before. I'm going to just read and I'm show you what what the Cortex M4 is doing, right? So I'm gonna press here zero on the serial port of the microcontroller. Sorry, I should change to that terminal. Zero. As you can see, I received a message, right? I'm reading the RP message file. I received this message from the microcontroller. The value of the temperature and the status of the fan. I'm going to press 1. 1 ASCII is 49 decimal, right? So that's what I'm receiving here. 2, 3, 4, 5. So my threshold, I think it's uh, 76, 66. So if I press B, the fan is going to be turned on. If I press A, the fan is going to be turned off. Right. So this is the message that's coming from the Cortex uh, M4. I'm going to run here this script that's going to take this message and put in the text file that's going to be read by the web server. So I'm going to run this script here. Right. I'm going to take here the, the web server. Run. So here. I'm going to press one. And you can see it updated here, 49. Let me open, let me increase here the size. Two, three, four, five, six, A, B, fun is all. Very good, so what we have here? We have a firmware running on the Cortex 4 inside the IMAX 7. 
that's monitoring a sensor. In my case, I'm uh, emulating that with a serial port and actuating in a fan, and then send a message to the to the Cortex uh, A7 that's taking this message and showing in a web page. The web page, of course, is very ugly, but I just want to show you the communication here. And this, that's my point about using a uh, heterogeneous multiprocessing system with real-time applications, right? We have two cores, one responsible for the real-time uh, stuff and the other responsible for the general stuff like networking, graphical, etc. Okay, uh, well, this is some references you could use uh, to learn a little bit about uh, the implementation of systems using uh, heterogeneous multiprocessing systems and asymmetric multiprocessing systems. We have the OpenMP framework. You have some very good uh, video presentations. You can find these video presentations uh, on YouTube. And we have uh, some tutorials on the internet, like this one from, from Toradex. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, here I'm, here uh, are my, is my contact and mail. Uh, feel free to write me. I'm going to publish this, all this material, source code, the presentation on my blog as soon as the conference is online. So you can check out embeddedbits.org to find out more about uh, uh, OpenMP and all of that. I'm going to publish uh, in a blog post on my, on my blog. And I hope you enjoy it. Feel free to, to send me a message uh, or uh, write me if needed. So uh, thank you.